In this video, we'll take a look at the Wittig reaction. And the uh, W in Wittig is pronounced as a V because the person who invented this was uh, German. So the Wittig reaction is a useful method to create regio-specific alkenes. So what this means is that you make only one alkene product in terms of the bond connectivity, which carbons are bound to which carbons. There are stereochemical outcomes. It can be a E or a Z uh, stereochemistry of the alkene product, but the regiochemistry is always the same. Again, the bond connectivity. Now, um, this is very useful because other ways to make alkenes, like eliminations with E1 and E2, usually make multiple products. So the Wittig reaction is a way to get around that. You make a unambiguously one, one product with this method. Now, the general reaction of a Wittig reaction is as shown. You'll have a, a general uh, carbonyl. It'll either be from a ketone or an aldehyde in general. And then you will react this with a phosphonium illid. And this is essentially a carbon nucleophile, the, the phosphonium illid. This will attack the carbonyl, and we'll go through the mechanism later. But the ultimate reaction is you get this regiospecific alkene, where you essentially replace the oxygen, the carbonyl oxygen, with the phosphonium illid group. That's not the, uh, the triphenylphosphine. So if you notice, you have R prime, R prime in the carbon, R prime, R prime in the carbon that's connecting those two. So that's what I mean by if you take this group, it essentially replaces the oxygen in making your regio specific alkene. And you can think about that as a way to kind of shorthand these reactions. And as a byproduct, you'll make triphenylphosphine oxide, which is this phosphorus uh, carbonyl like species where you have a double bond between the phosphorus and the oxygen and then uh, the triphenyl. And we'll talk about the, the choice of the Y triphenyl over some other phosphine in, in, in later in the video. So next then, uh, there's some definitions I wanna talk about here. So first of all, the most important one to mention here is an illid. So we looked at specifically phosphonium illid. So phosphonium just means that you have a protonated phosphorus group. That's phosphonium. And then the illid means that you have a neutral molecule with a positive and negative charges that are on adjacent atoms, which is the case in our phosphonium illid. If we go above, see we have a positive charge on the phosphorus, which is adjacent to the negative charge of the carbon. Now you may be familiar with this other term, which is a Zwitter ion. A Zwitter ion is not necessarily an illid, or an, an illid is always a Zwitter ion, but it's not, it doesn't work the other way. A Zwitter ion is a neutral molecule with an equal number of positive and negative charges. So again, it's net neutral, but the position of those positive and negative charges can be on any atoms in the molecule. In the illid, the positive and negative charge has to be adjacent to each other, and that's the key defining feature. So I'll reiterate this point. So the key difference is the illid requires the positive and negative charges to be on adjacent atoms. And, uh, but the Zwitter ion does not have the same requirement. The positive and negative charges can be on any atom in the molecule and it would still be considered a Zwitter ion. So the Wittig reaction can generally be viewed in two stages. Uh, if you look at the entirety of the Wittig reaction, there's two steps. The first stage is a formation of the phosphonium illid. And in our general scheme, we just started with a phosphonium illid, but there usually are ways that you need to make this, which is commonly thrown in with the, the Wittig reaction. And secondly, then, the reaction of that phosphonium illid that you created in step one with the carbonyl species, which is either an aldehyde or a ketone, that will generate the alkene. So those are the two stages. So first, we have the formation of the phosphonium illid. So that is also in two stages. The first stage of the formation of the phosphonium illid is that you have an SN2 reaction to form the phosphonium salt. And again, I'll show an example of this, but uh, this is just the general scheme. And then B, once you've created the phosphonium salt, you'll have an acid-base reaction to create the phosphonium illid, where you transform the phosphonium salt into the phosphonium illid. So what this looks like is as follows. Here's a, a general scheme of this. So first, we have triphenylphosphine, and uh, by the way, I mentioned uh, just phosphine is pH 3, so it's phosphorus bound to three hydrogens, 
and triphenylphosphine, a phenyl group, is a benzene substituent. So the reason we use triphenylphosphine instead of phosphine or some other uh, phosphorus uh, source is triphenylphosphine is a uh, solid, just a white powder that can easily use in reactions and dissolved in some solvent, whereas uh, phosphine is rather toxic and it's a gas. So it's very difficult to use just phosphine with three hydrogens. So instead we use the triphenylphosphine basically for practical purposes. Now, this first step involves using the triphenylphosphine as a nucleophile to attack some uh, electrophile like uh, this primary alkyl halide, and alpha bromide in this case. And now uh, keep in mind, I'll, uh, the phosphorus is a very good nucleophile. But the triphenyl is a rather bulky substituent on that phosphorus. So the point here is that the phosphorus is such a good nucleophile that it can still undergo these types of reactions, even though it's sterically hindered. And I'll leave a link in the description to my video that describes the, telling the difference between a good nucleophile and a, and a good, good base. However, the triphenylphosphine is still weakly basic. So you need to do this type of first step reaction on a primary or secondary alkyl halide because if you were to do it on a tertiary alkyl halide, you are going to get E2 instead of the desired SN2. So keep that in mind. Here we have a primary alkyl halide, so it's something that we don't need to consider, but keep that in mind for other types of uh, situations. And then this will make the triphosphonium uh, salt, which is simply where the phosphorus has replaced the bromine in an SN2 style reaction, and you put a positive charge on the phosphorus. Now, what this positive charge on the phosphorus has done is make that alpha hydrogen, the hydrogen that is uh, on the carbon adjacent to the phosphorus, is now slightly acidic because if you were to remove that, you can then have resonant stabilization of the conjugate base, which is uh, the driving force for why this is weakly as, uh, acidic, this alpha proton. So if you use a really strong base like butyl lithium here, you can remove that proton and then create the triphenylphosphonium illid here. Now, by the way, I mentioned this is resonance stabilized. This is the driving force for the, uh, the acidity of that um, proton here, this alpha proton. So the resonance would simply be this structure. And you may wonder, well, hey, why can that phosphorus have an expanded octet? And yeah, it's below the second row. So it will be able to uh, contain an expanded octet like this. And this, this is fine to draw it like this. We usually keep it in the charged state to show, to illustrate the nucleophilic nature of the carbon, which must be present because uh, of the mechanism, which we'll get into next. So, and then lastly, you'll have the creation of the alkene which is the generic um, Wittig reaction where you have the triphenylphosphonium illid reacting with a, a specific carbonyl. Here it's an acetone uh, structure, and this will create the alkene product here. Again, you can think about this as the R group of the illid is replacing the oxygen here. So here is uh, imagine if this was rotated a 90 degrees uh, clockwise or counterclockwise, you'll put the methyl groups up and then uh, you have this one R group sticking out on the bottom carbon. So uh, we'll get into the mechanism, but this is rather complicated. So I just want to show the general scheme. And then by the way, you'll create the triphenylphosphine oxide as a byproduct, which uh, is essential if you want to, you need to make sure you keep track of all of your atoms involved in the reaction. All right, now we'll take a look at the reaction mechanism, specifically of the illid step when the illid is reacting with the carbonyl. So the first few steps are as follows. You're going to have your phosphonium illid, which we showed the mechanism of the SN2 and acid base that would create the phosphonium illid. This then is a good carbon nucleophile. This is going to attack the electrophilic position of your carbonyl, in this case acetone. And what I've shown here is uh, I've labeled the carbon. So carbon-4 is our nucleophilic carbon. This is going to create a bond to carbon-2, and then the electrons are going to um, kick up onto the oxygen to uh, keep uh, the, uh, the, oxygen, the electron count rather on carbon number 2. This has to happen concertedly because if it's not, then the carbon-2 would have five bonds, and as we know, that cannot happen. So uh, that, that will happen, and students struggle with visualizing this, so this is why I always 
number these carbons here. And what I've shown now is carbon four and five is this moiety here of the triphenylphosphine that's sticking out now uh, down into the right like this. And we created this bond between carbon four and carbon two up here. And then carbon two also is bound to the oxygen with the negative charge that I put sticking out down into the right as well. And then you have to keep track of your carbon. So you have, of course, um, the methyl groups of one and three that are bound to carbon number two as well. Now, at this point, it's rather intuitive. You have coulombic attraction between the negatively charged oxygen and the positively charged phosphorus of the phosphonium uh, moiety there. So the oxygen, uh, one of the lone pairs on the oxygen will attack that phosphorus to create a oxygen phosphorus bond. That creates this uh, four-membered ring here, as I've shown in this step. Now, these four-membered rings are extremely strained and they want to cleave. So once you get to this step, this cleavage can occur, as I've drawn here, where you're forming the phosphorus-oxygen bond and the carbon-carbon double bond at the same time in a concerted mechanism. And it doesn't matter which bond you start with, really. All you need to show is that you're forming the phosphorus-oxygen bond and the carbon-carbon double bond. So you could have drawn it kind of in the opposite way if you wanted to. And I'll, I'll illustrate this when we get to the example problems towards the end, but here's just the, a general scheme and I'm just showing one way and it doesn't matter which way you do that. So then the resulting products is your regioselective alkene here, where you've created, um, the, these are carbons, let's uh, number them the same as they were in the beginning. So there, one, two, three is your acetone moiety, and then four and five is the, uh, the ethyl group from your phosphonium illid. And then, of course, you create triphenylphosphine oxide as a byproduct, which is critical, again, for keeping track of all of your atoms. Now, I, there are several observations and comments I want to make here. So the first one is that the, the Wittig reactions have a strong thermodynamic driving force provided by the formation of the very strong phosphorus-oxygen bond. So you may think, you know, we're not interested in this triphenylphosphine oxide product. And you're, you're correct. We're not really interested in that product. But we are interested in the fact that it makes the reaction very thermodynamic, meaning that it is driven uh, in the forward direction. So it creates for good yields and um, for practical reasons, it, it becomes a very useful reaction because of the phosphorus oxygen bond that is created, which drives the reaction in the forward direction. So that's one observation. And secondly, uh, one major advantage of this is the regiospecificity, which I've mentioned now a, a couple of different times, is that you create very specific carbon-carbon double bonds with no rearrangement. And as we just saw in the mechanism, there's no carbocation or other intermediate that's susceptible to rearrangement. So you're always going to get this regiospecificity in the Wittig reactions. And then lastly, there is one main disadvantage of this reaction, and it's that Wittigs are more reactive with aldehydes than ketones. And the reasons for this is twofold. One, they're a steric hindrance of the R groups of the ketone because they're alkyl groups instead of just hydrogens. And additionally, as an electronic effect, is that there's an additional hyperconjugation of the, the ketone R groups, which stabilizes the uh, carbonyl carbon, making it less electrophilic. And as we just saw in the mechanism, we need the carbon nucleophile of the illid to attack the carbonyl um, electrophile, electrophilic carbon. So uh, by this extended hyperconjugation in the ketones, that makes them even um, less reactive towards the Wittig reaction than aldehydes. All right, now we'll talk about the stereochemical outcomes of the Wittig reaction. So we've already talked now about the regiospecificity and some of the other major advantages and disadvantages of the Wittig, but there are also ways that you can control if you have an E or a Z product. So the alkene can be E or Z. Remember, E is like trans and Z is like cis. And uh, this is generally determined by the illid with uh, the following pattern. So we have this stabilized illid makes the E isomer, the trans isomer, and the unstabilized illid makes the Z isomer. And it's like, okay, yeah, that's a great uh, general empirical rule, but you have to be able to identify what is considered a stabilized illid and what is considered an unstabilized illid to use this for uh, predicting your products, the stereochemistry of your product. So here I'll give you a couple examples to illustrate the difference. 
So a stabilized illid just has this additional stabilization. And the additional stabilization is usually in the form of an added resonant structure. So if you have a carbonyl that is on a the carbon adjacent to the one with the negative charge, so that is the case here. So of our, our illid, we have the carbon negative charge here. If we have a carbonyl adjacent to that position, then we can resonate up to the oxygen like is shown here, and this is an added stabilization, making this illid less reactive and therefore more stable because of the added um, resonant structure. Okay, now that's the stabilized illid. The unstabilized illid is basically everything else. It doesn't have this added uh, stabilization, so it makes it more reactive and then therefore less stable. And it's like, yeah, okay, so what? Why does this have an effect on the stereochemical outcome? Well, when you have a stabilized illid, it is uh, so far, it's so much less reactive that it actually creates an equilibrium during the alkene forming step, the alkene formation step, which since you're creating an equilibrium between the E and the Z products in that step, you're always going to favor the formation of the more stable uh, product, which is the E isomer. So because of this extra stabilization, the illid becomes less stable, creating this equilibrium in the product formation step, which then favors the more stable trans or E isomer as your stereochemical product. All right, for the remainder of the video, we'll take a look at a few questions to kind of tie all these ideas together. So our first question here is rank the following in order of increasing reactivity towards nucleophilic addition to a phosphonium illid. This is the, the Wittig reaction. So let's number these one to four. And if we recall, uh, aldehydes are more reactive towards uh, the Wittig reaction. And remember that is twofold. The reason for that is twofold. One is that there's less sterics from the hydrogen. And secondly, the carbon is more electrophilic. The carbonyl carbon is more electrophilic because it does not have a hyperconjugation from the R groups. So this means that one is our most reactive. And we need to go in order of increasing reactivity. So one is the most reactive. So it'll be all the way down here in our list. Now we have to rank two to four, which are all ketones. And we have to rank which one is more likely to react than the other. So the only difference is we have, in two, we have two T-butyl groups, three, we have a methyl and a T-butyl, and four, we just have acetone, so therefore two methyls. So the, the, again, the main factors are the hyperconjugation and steric effects. So sterically, the T-butyl groups are extremely bulky. They also have more carbons to donate their, uh, to stabilize the carbon of the carbonyl, making them less electrophilic. So the least likely to react is actually two. And then three is more likely than that because it at least has one methyl group instead of a di-t-butyl. And then four is more reactive than both of those because it just has the dimethyl. And then we get to the aldehyde, which is of course the most reactive. All right, moving on to the next question here. So here, this has to do with the stereochemical outcomes. So the question is, which illid is more likely to produce the E alkene? So remember, as we just discussed, the E alkene is formed with a stabilized illid. And remember, the stabilized illid has the additional resonance structure. So what we have to do is assess each of these molecules to see if we have um, increased resonance in any one of them. So if we look at, let's call this one to three, Molecule one has no possibility for resonance because there is no carbonyl nearby. There's nothing. There's just there's just methyl or just alkyl groups. So nothing uh, su suitable for resonance. So one we can throw out. That would not make the E. That would primarily make the Z isomer. Now if we look at two, we do have this adjacent carbonyl. So now we have to take a look at the um, resonance structure, right? So. I'll draw this molecule down here to show the resonance. Okay, so the resonance structure would involve this, these arrows.
And by the way, this is something I just thought of. This is a Zwitter ion, but no longer an illid because the oxygen negative charge is not adjacent to the phosphorus positive charge. So just tying that other idea together. But this does have the extended uh, resonant structure. So we would expect that this would predominantly make E, molecule two. Now let's look at three to confirm that there isn't um, more resonance in three than there is two, because that would also mean that it's more likely to make E than the other one. But here, the negative charge is too far away to this carbonyl to resonate. So the answer is only molecule two will make the E. So two uh, will make E. All right, here we have another question to take a look at, and we are asked to draw a complete mechanism to predict the product, and we need to include any stereochemistry if that is necessary. So this is a complete Wittig reaction where we need to make our phosphonium illid and then react that with the carbonyl. So the first step then is this SN2 reaction with the, the good nucleophile, which is the phosphorus, attacking our good electrophile, this primary electrophile of the propyl bromide. So this will attack the electrophilic carbon and create this product, the phosphonium salt. Okay, and now what we've done is created that the alpha proton is now acidic. So acidic enough that a extremely strong base like butyl lithium can abstract it. So that's what the butyl lithium does. It's an acid base reaction where that proton is removed, like shown, like shown. And then this will make the phosphonium illid. Now this is poised to attack the carbonyl, which in this case is the um, aldehyde. So I'm going to redraw that down here to give myself some space. So this is a carbon nucleophile, which will attack the carbon electrophile here, which is the, the carbonyl carbon, and kick the electrons up. Now, again, like I mentioned before, this is a part where students often get extremely confused. So the only way to combat this is to count all of your carbons and pay attention to, very careful attention, to what bonds are being formed and where. So carbon one is forming a bond to carbon four. So let's just start by drawing this exact moiety and then showing where the, the connectivity has added to change the, the structure. Right, so here is everything exactly as drawn, is exactly as drawn above, and then now we're creating a bond between one and four. Right, so one and four, we've created that bond. Let me number all of these to make this more clear. So there's one, two, three, this is now four. And then we also have five sticking out here, which is just the methyl group on the acetaldehyde. Right, and then at carbon four, there's also the oxygen, of course. So we have the oxygen, which I've drawn like this because I have a little bit of foresight that we're gonna make this four-membered ring. If you didn't recognize that, that at this point, that's totally okay. This, this takes a lot of practice. And once you see that you're gonna make the four-membered ring, you can always redraw your intermediates and nobody would take off points for that. So now you have this coulombic attraction between the oxygen and the phosphorus, creating the four-membered ring, which will then give you the, um, the product eventually. So here you have the four-membered ring. And I'm just copying everything exactly as it was drawn before. All right, so keeping the numbers, one, two, three, four, and five. Oops, sorry about that. So now uh, you created this four-membered ring. So as I mentioned before, when you have these four-membered rings, they're extremely strained. So they're ready to cleave. And again, we know that the phosphorus oxygen bond that's formed is extremely stable and thermodynamically driving. So then we can pick one of the uh, bonds, either the carbon phosphorus bond or the carbon oxygen bond to cleave to form the phosphorus oxygen bond. And it makes no difference because the other one will form the carbon-carbon double bond. So this is what I was mentioning before. It doesn't matter which one you pick so long as you're forming the phosphorus-oxygen double bond, and then the other uh, option will make the carbon-carbon double bond. And 
again, keep in mind this is a unstabilized illid, so we're going to get the Z or the cis isomer, which is what my mechanism represents. This it appears that it would create um, the Z, and that is exactly what happens. And then we get uh, triphenylphosphine oxide, which um, is just the byproduct, but again, it's important because it drives it's the driver for the reaction. So carbons one and four become the alkene, and then we have the triphenyl phosphine oxide byproduct, again, driving the reaction in the forward direction. All right, here we have another question. And again, we are asked to draw a complete mechanism to, to predict the product and including any stereochemistry if necessary. So here, it's slightly different because we are, we are already at the phosphonium salt. We don't have to undergo the SN2 initially to make the phosphonium salt. And uh, so this first step then in this mechanism is the abstraction of the alpha proton that is somewhat acidic because it's adjacent to the uh, phosphorus positive charge. And in addition, this is more acidic because it's also adjacent to the carbonyl, which has uh, extended resonance, so stabilization of the conjugate base. So this butyl um, group is negatively charged. That will abstract the hydrogen here and create the negative charge here, which is then our illid, which has this structure. Now, this, uh, as you recall, this is a stabilized illid because the negative charge is adjacent to the carbonyl. Or, I mean, in here in this case, it's carbonyl, but it could be anything that can take electrons, anything that electrons can delocalize to. So in this case, we have the, the carbonyl, but it could be like a cyano group or, or something else that has uh, electrons that can delocalize. So here I'll show the resonant structure to illustrate why. This is a stabilized illid. So, and then recall that stabilized illids make the E isomer. So that's what our, our product should represent. So now I'm going to redraw this just for ease of mechanism, since it's kind of messy now, because I showed the resonance. In the, if you were asked to do this on an exam or something, you wouldn't necessarily need to show the resonance. But I think it's important to make that point here because that explains why you get only the E isomer is because of this uh, resonance stabilization. All right, so then the illid can now react with the aldehyde. And that's what will happen. All right, so again, keep track of all your carbons to make this as easy as possible. So uh, carbon one and four are creating a bond. So I'll draw this exactly as it was to start. All right, so that's one, two, three. And then you create now a bond to the uh, carbon number four. And then you're going to create uh, you're going to remain the, the, the remaining atoms, of course. So one, two, three, and four and five. Right now, this, again, can have the Coulombic attraction creating the ring that we're interested in. I'm not going to draw the numbers this time just uh, because I think it's clear at this point. I don't want to be too redundant. So uh, now, again, you've created this four-membered ring. These are very unstable, so they're going to cleave and, and form the product. So again, it doesn't matter which one you start with. So now this time I'll start with the other carbon to show that you just make that phosphorus oxygen bond. And then the other carbon bond will form the alkene. That's really what you're interested in in terms of like what product you want to isolate. So now, at this point, you're going to make the Z isomer plus um, the triphenylphosphine oxide, which I'll just draw at the bottom as a minus triphenylphosphine oxide, because uh, that's a byproduct and we're not interested in it. But now, due to the, the stabilization of the illid, this will equilibrate with the E isomer.
And because of that, E is more stable. This is going to predominate because this equilibrium will be driven in the forward direction towards E because of the stabilization of E overall and the, the, the lack of reactivity of the stabilized ilid. So this is your final product is this E isomer. And what we've shown here would be the complete mechanism. So that is all I have for this video. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more content like this. If you have a suggestion or a topic idea or anything like that, feel free to leave it in the comment section below and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. So that's all I have. I hope you have a great day and I'll see you in the next video.